Okay, here we go. Focus. Speed. I am speed. One winner, 17 losers. I eat losers for breakfast. Breakfast. Huh. Maybe I should have had breakfast. Actually... Oh yeah, intro. When you're a kid obsessed with video games, I don't think it's uncommon to be constantly thinking up ideas for what would be your perfect video game. Or at least a game that to your five-year-old brain would be the most amazing game of all time. When I was younger, I vividly remember thinking up a game that featured real-world cars driving in very unrealistic locations. Like Mustangs on Mars, Volvos inside of volcanoes, or even Corvettes in a dragon's castle. Of course, this also led me to dream up a sister game in which you drove very unrealistic vehicles through very real locations. Spaceships through Seattle, hoverboards through Hong Kong, jetpacks through Jamaica. Enough alliteration, you get the idea. I can't really describe why I was so attached to the idea. It was just the mere thought of vehicles mashed up with locations that didn't belong together logically always tickled my imagination, even almost 20 years later. And while there was never a game that really did an idea like this, at least the way I thought of it in my mind, as far as I know anyway, if there ever was, my god, please let me know in the comments. The game that came closest was Bizarre Creations game Blur. Do you remember Blur? I keep trying to remember it, but it's all a blur. Blur is a racing game released in May of 2010 for the Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and Microsoft Windows, made by Bizarre Creations and published by Activision. Within the racing genre, there have always been lots of subgenres, from kart racing to simulations, futuristic racing to arcade likes. Most typically stick to a single specific subgenre, but Blur was one of the first games that I remember really striving to fuse an arcadey driving experience with real cars and real locations with the chaos and bombastic gameplay of kart racing style items. Blur is a game that I have very fond memories of, specifically playing it with my friends and local multiplayer the summer it was released. It wasn't until I purchased the game for myself on PC a couple years later when I realized just how much I loved playing Blur. The main meat of the game is its single player career mode, where you're a new driver to the Power Up Racing League, and have to take on different rivals to move up the ranks and become the best racer in the league. While its premise is fairly generic, everything about the game in my opinion is far from it. On the surface, you could easily say that the gameplay is simply a hybrid of Mario Kart and Need for Speed and you wouldn't entirely be wrong. But if you take a look back at the development history of Bizarre Creations games, the origins of this hybrid style game seem much more apparent to me. Bizarre Creations started out as the development team known as Raising Hell back in 1988 with the release of their first game, Combat Crazy for the Commodore 64. While the studio has released a variety of games before and after they changed the name to Bizarre Creations, the Liverpool-based team was primarily known for two types of video games, arcade racers and retro-style arcade games, particularly with the Project Gotham Racing series and Geometry Wars series respectively. The Project Gotham Racing games were developed exclusively for the Xbox line of consoles and revolved around earning kudos points that is, points for pulling off fancy maneuvers and stunts while racing. Similarly, Blur has the fan system, whereby doing things in the race or completing extra challenges called fan demands, you earn fans, which work like experience points. The more fans you earn, the more you level up, and as you level up, you unlock new and better cars to race with. On the other hand, while not as directly influential like Project Gotham Racing, Blur takes a lot of notes from Geometry Wars. 
Just look at the neon-drenched, explosive simplicity of Geometry Wars, and it's easy to see similarities in the design of Blur's items. In a lot of ways, Blur is the ultimate Bizarre Creations game, combining everything the studio is known for into one title. Blur's main gameplay is divided into two sections, the single-player career mode and the multiplayer mode, which allows you to play with up to four people for split-screen local multiplayer and with up to 20 people in online multiplayer. Like I said before, Blur's local multiplayer is what got me hooked on the game to begin with, and it's awesome. Racing around and blowing each other up was just so addictive and fun. It made the game truly stand out in my mind as something unique, and a large contributing factor to why I bought the game for myself years later. However, it was the game's single player that I became addicted to when I acquired my own copy, and the career mode is what I'll be focusing on for the majority of this retrospective. As previously mentioned, the goal of career mode is to move your way up the ranks, taking out rivals to become the best racer in the Powered Up Racing League. Each rival serves as its own kind of world, with multiple events in each section. Beating rivals earns you new mods that enhance your power-ups, and also unlocks the rival's specific vehicle. Each one-on-one -on -one rival race allows you to get a ton of lights, which unlocks more events. By completing events, players earn lights and fans per their performance and progress to the game. There are three main event types. The first is Race, the main meat and potatoes of Blur. You race on one of the game's tracks that come from 14 different real-world locations, like Japan, New York, and Barcelona, using power-ups to take down your opponents. With their vivid colors and wide variety of uses that challenge player reflexes and creativity, the power-ups are what gives Blur its identity. The game features eight main power-ups for the player to take advantage of. Bolt allows you to fire small projectiles forward and backwards. They don't do a lot of serious damage, but they can screw with your ability to control your vehicle. Shunt shoots out a massive homing ball of energy that zeroes in on the vehicle in front of you, causing major wipeouts. Mines can be dropped or shot a short distance in front of you and will cause opponents to spin out if they hit the mine. Barge is an equally offensive and defensive weapon that shoves cars and destroys power-ups that are within a close range of you. Shock lays down electrical fields at the front of the race that massively slows down anyone who drives through them, primarily designed to trip up the leader of the race. Very fitting considering that the color of the power-up is blue. Nitro gives you a tremendous surge of speed, Shield gives you a temporary force field of protection from items, and Repair refills your health bar and fixes all visible signs of damage to your vehicle. Using these items, players must take on the other racers in what feels like a modern, yet also sci-fi-like death battle to come in first place. The second mode, Demolition, requires you to use the Bolt power-up to shoot cars racing in front of you. Hitting and wrecking cars puts more time on the clock, so it becomes a game of high score and survival. Each car also releases a power-up when destroyed. This creates an obstacle that the player must avoid, but can also be used to the player's advantage, as those power-ups can also be used to destroy and damage other vehicles, making for exciting combo opportunities. Finally, the last event type is Checkpoint. These are like time trials in that you race around to checkpoint gates on the track. There are no opponents, and the only items are nitros and clocks that will add to your time. These events are like performing open heart surgery in Trauma Center. They require precision and pure skill. The better the time you get, the more lights you receive. While there isn't a lot of variety of the basic gameplay modes, it's the fan demands that really shake up the levels and set them apart from one another. Fan demands serve as achievement-like challenges that are different for each race, such as hitting two cars in front of you with mines, hitting another racer with a barge while drifting, or hitting a certain speed within a limited amount of time. Between the high-speed racing, dodging items and projectiles, and attempting to complete fan demands to get bonus points, the gameplay loop of Blur is incredibly satisfying keeping the player engaged at all times. But with as fun as the game is, and it's seriously like really freaking fun, it's Blur's production values that I remember most of all when I think back to Blur, and where I think the game truly shines. With the exception of like some foliage details, even a decade later this game still stuns me with how gorgeous it is, especially with the level of detail given to the cars and power-ups themselves. The varying degrees of how damaged your car can get are so detailed compared to other games, there are still some times where I find myself cringing from just how beat up the vehicle can become. It may not have all the trimmings and beauty of a modern racing game like Forza Horizon, but for a game that was created for the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3, the graphics still look great. That's due in large part to Blur's art direction. From the contrast between the desaturated environments and the neon items that cast their colors all over the scenery to the clean, modern aesthetic of its menus, Blur carries a visual identity that still feels as relevant today as the day it was released. With all the Helvetica-esque, is that a word? Fonts, to the logo designs for each rival set of missions and the app-like icons that are used in everything from the items to the achievements, this game is like a collegiate graphic designer's dream, speaking from personal experience. Even the rivals themselves, who with one exception you barely ever see and never hear outside of their actual portrait, ooze such character and personality. Look at this guy, Drake. Like, you can just feel how big and loud and obnoxious he is. Like, this guy goes around calling people brother, I can feel it. He's like, hey, brother, I feel you, brother. Wanna go grab some cores? <laughs> That one exception to speaking I mentioned is Shannon, your first and, spoilers, 
Final Rival, who is also the narrator for the game's menus and tutorials, and is voiced by former NASCAR and Indy driver Danica Patrick, which I never knew until doing research for this video. All right, you've gained access to the showdown. Here, you'll be facing your toughest opponents again, only this time, all at once. Everything you've done so far has led you here. The real game is about to begin. Even the intro screens have that little extra oomph of flair with buildings, structures, and cars popping out of the letterboxes. This was always a really cool effect that I really, really liked, and is probably a big influence for how and why I design a lot of my thumbnails the way that I do. The world of Blur and its visuals are further complemented by the game's phenomenal sound design. Blur features a licensed music soundtrack of house and EDM music, mostly comprised of Crystal Method tracks. But by default, you only hear the music in the menus and during high action sequences, like destruction events and when you challenge rivals. While you can set the music to be played during every event, I think it's safe to say that this was an intentional choice by the developers that works in the game's favor. In the silence of Blur's races, you're met with an orchestra of cacophonous sound, from the different engine sounds to the slamming and screeching of cars, buildings whipping by you, and most importantly, the sound of the items. Each item has its own unique identifying sound that works so well I can tell exactly what item is where around me at all times based purely on the sound effects alone. When all the sounds come together, it creates a blend of noises that doesn't really need music to back it up. At the end of the day, Blur is one of the games I think of when I think of the word fun. It's sensory overload in all the best ways. Chaotic competitive racing, explosive sounds and visuals, and just overall a very well-crafted package. Like I said in the beginning, Blur is the quintessential Bizarre Creations game, which is an ironic shame when you consider the fact that this was the second to last game to come from the studio, with the final being a James Bond game released in November of 2010. Huh? How did this happen? Blur was highly praised at the time of its release and is still a stellar game to this day, yet the game sold abysmally. But what could have been the cause for such a fantastic game to flop so horribly? I think Blur's failure boils down to two major facts. First is poor timing. Blur was not the only arcade racing game releasing in May of 2010. In fact, only a week prior, Disney Interactive and BlackRock Studio released their arcade racer Split Second. The two games, while both being arcade racers, are very different in that Blur focuses on real-world cars using unrealistic power-up, while Split Second uses fictional cars racing on the set of a fictional TV show rigged with explosives used to wreck your opponents. It feels very evocative of Burnout. To this day, there are still gamers who argue about which arcade racer was better for the time. I personally think that both are great and do different things very well, but I still prefer Blur mainly for its presentation. Even my buddy Mr. Gamescoop, back 10 years ago, gave Split Second a thumbs up rental review. I still stand by it. Gamescoop approved. I mean, how can you argue with that logic? But to add on to that, on the same release date as Blur, Sony released the PlayStation 3 exclusive Mod Nation Racers. Three arcadey racing games in the span of a week? It's unrealistic to expect consumers to cough up for all three titles, and sales were likely split. <laughs> split. Three ways between the games, with Blur massively underperforming. The second reason, or reasons, that I feel Blur failed to make an impact on launch was its poor advertising campaign, and its failure to communicate who the audience for the game was. Let's tackle Blur's TV advertising first, which was one of the things that inspired me to research the marketing for the game in the first place. I remember being an angsty teen in the summer of 2010 and seeing this commercial on TV at my grandparents' house. Blame. Awesome. Racing's not about winning, it's about making friends! Blah. Shut up, Pinky! Blur. Race like a big boy. Rated everyone 10 and up. Honestly, I don't know if I've ever heard something so at odds with itself, yet also so perfect. At the time, I just kind of laughed the advertisement off. I thought it was mildly funny and went on with my moody life. Looking back on it now, it honestly makes my soul cringe. The most glaringly obvious and unsubtle tactic of the commercial is to take a jab at Mario Kart. Someone in the marketing department really thought, You know what would be a great idea? Since our game is so similar to Mario Kart, let's make a commercial calling the Mario Kart player based babies. You like your Mario baby games, you dumb little baby? 
with your little dumb baby hands. That's right, you're a baby. My boss is not a baby. But there are baby bosses out there. You dumb little baby. You don't even understand what I'm saying. You don't even know who I am. Here, who are you, you little baby? You little dumb little baby with your little feet and your little laughs and your little mouth? You little dumb baby bottom baby boy? What are you gonna do about it, huh? You little dumb- Honestly, I mean, I kind of get it. Callouts have been a part of video gaming practically since the industry's inception, but this just isn't the way to do it. While Mario Kart is a game franchise that is played by people of all ages, I think it's safe to say that a significant cross-section of Mario Kart players, mostly kids and teens, are also part of the target audience Blur was trying to reel in. So why make fun of your potential customers? But these TV ads were not the only confusing portion of Blur's marketing campaign, as I learned while digging deeper into the official Blur YouTube account. In the months leading up to the game's release, Blur teamed up with Maxim Magazine for a cross-promotional photo shoot and nationwide contest featuring hometown hotties that dressed up as power-ups from Blur. <laughs> Yeah, you can't make this stuff up. Uh, additionally, people could enter a contest online to win a date with one of the girls to play Blur early. Like the TV advertisement, looking back on this in 2020, it's all personally kind of cringy. For a game that has hardly any real character models to begin with, and even advertise itself as being half-naked women free back when it was revealed at E3, this just seems like a weird pairing with the game. <laughs> so, uh, what we've done is approach them in a really sort of uh, what we think is a sensible way. So for instance, the storyline won't have big sort of dirty cutscenes with half-naked women. Photo shoots and modeling can work really well with game launches, Bayonetta 2 for example, but that only really works when it pairs well with the game. Clashing two things together like this just feels tacky, but my main problem comes down to the conflicting audiences these two campaigns seem to be targeting. The Blur x Maxim campaign is quite obviously geared towards adults, while the TV ads seem to be aimed more at children and teens. And there's nothing wrong with trying to sell your game to as many people as possible, but these two execution methods just clash so horribly and make you wonder who the game is really intended to be for. If it's for adults, then the Race Like a Big Boy TV ads have an almost extra layer of cringe added. But if children and teens are the target audience, then using sex appeal to sell your game feels cheap and scummy. In the end, Blur is a game that can be played by anyone, and the advertising should have reflected that. But instead, it chose to segment the audience into two camps, making the advertising feel scattered and messy. In conclusion, Blur was simply a great game that was lost in a wave of other great racing games and marred by a poor advertising campaign. Despite all of its financial shortcomings in terms of sales, Blur is still one of my all-time favorite games, and possibly one of my favorite games to come from the previous decade. It's a game that just feels so fun to play, an exhilarating thrill ride every minute. As a graphic designer, Blur resonates with me on a deeper level than most other games as well. It's tough to say if Blur's execution influenced my own style considering I played it a lot so long ago, or if I feel more drawn to it now because I see a lot of similarities between what I make and how the UI is presented. Regardless, Blur is a game that 10 years later keeps me coming back for more. Every so often I still get the itch to break the game out and replay the career mode. Fortunately, I still have my physical copy on PC, which is now one of the few ways you can still play the game. The game can also be played on an original Xbox 360 or PS3 if you can track down a copy. Blur was listed on Steam for a while, but it was eventually removed, likely due to expiring licenses with either the music or car manufacturers. It's not backwards compatible with the Xbox One either, unfortunately, which makes it harder and harder to play the game today, which is really a shame. There were talks and even recent leaks of dev builds of a sequel game from a decade ago, which included awesome things like wall driving. But with Activision closing Bizarre Creations, it seems very unlikely that we will see a Blur 2 releasing anytime soon, especially with Activision only pursuing games that can milk like a money cow. Maybe with the recent trend of remastering old games, we may see a Blur remaster one day, but I'm not holding my breath. But what about you? Do you remember Blur? It's genuinely one of my all-time favorite racing games and one of my favorite games from the previous generation. As always, let me know your thoughts about Blur down in the comments. If you've made it to the end of the video, thank you so much for watching. I'm sorry it took me so long to get this video out, but real life has been taking first priority recently. I hope it was worth the wait and that my inconsistent upload schedule isn't too cumbersome. Even though I probably spend way too much time on my videos, I love creating them and sharing them with you all. 
Again, thank you so much for watching. Stay safe, and I'll see you next time.